<laughs> Hi everyone and welcome to Greenlight Bookstore. We're going to get started on tonight's event. Thank you so much for braving this awful weather and joining us tonight. We're excited to have you all here. Um, tonight we will be hosting Michael Peterson presenting his new book, Boyfriends. He will be talking with John Ray and you're in for an excellent evening. Just a couple of housekeeping things. Um, if you could please be sure to keep your mask on during the event if you are not reading tonight. Um, please silence your cell phones. We don't want anything going off during the reading. And we have lots of signed books of Michael's available for sale tonight that you can grab at the register once we're finished. So, fun stuff now. Our interviewer for this evening is John Ray. Ray is the author, most recently, of the novel Godsend. The recipient of a Guggenheim Fellowship, a Whiting Award, and a Coleman Fellowship from the New York Public Library, among other accolades, he was named one of Granta's best young American novelists in 2007. FSG will publish Gone to the Wolves in May 2023. John will be speaking with our featured author, Michael Peterson, who is a prize-winning Scottish poet and author. His second collection, Oyster, published in 2017, was a collaboration with the late Scott Hutchinson of the band Frightened Rabbit. Peterson has been named a Canongate Future 40, was a finalist in 2018 for Writer of the Year at the Herald Scottish Culture Awards, was awarded the John Mather Trust Rising Star of Literature Award, and won a Robert Louis Stevenson Fellowship. In Michael's new book, Boyfriends, he confronts the bewildering process of grief. As memories rise to the surface, both heart-wrenching and hilarious, he recalls his younger self, the overly sensitive boy growing up in working-class Edinburgh, his befuddling stint in, in an ancient collegiate university, a short-lived, combustible career as a lawyer, and foremost, the gorgeous male friendships that have transformed his life. Michael will be reading from his book tonight, and then John will join him in conversation, and afterwards you'll have a chance to ask some questions. So please join me in a round of applause for Michael and John. Thank you for that. I very much second the thanks for braving the weather. It's uh, what we'd call bogging out there in Scotland. I feel like I've brought the Scottish weather to New York, which was accidental. I have packed a lot of Hawaiian shirts. I was told fall was the best time of the year to come. Not too hot, but sunny enough to you know take your top off if you're feeling bold. Uh, so I'm going to read a few bits of the book for you. Um, this is the book. I'm showing you that because I'm not going to be reading from it because it's still quite new. So I don't know where all the stuff is in it and you have to jump between the pages quite a lot and it can be quite awkward when you're flicking there. So I thought I want to come up like a professional. So I'll print off those pages in an orderly fashion and I'll put them in that order. I might even number them in that you know popular numerical fashion that human civilization has been doing for thousands of years. It would be arrogant of me for, to question that at this point in time. Um, but I didn't want to flap sheets of paper around in front of you. That could be risky. A night like this, when it's wet and sodden, they could get they could get wet and sodden and curl over in a very unattractive manner. But I'm going to come to America like a pro, a professional at the top of this game. So I've got myself a racing red clipboard. <laughs> I've went one step beyond and got a sparkly Michael spoofed across his back. <laughs> so this book, boyfriends, it's a uh, it's a book with grief squatting its belly. Um, there is there is horrendous losses in it. There's hardship in it. There's the murky stuff that churns all of those stars up in the belly. But mainly, it's a book of celebration. It's a book of joy. It's a book of tribute to friends. Um, it's for the friends here, there and elsewhere, the friends we love to excess yet still not nearly enough, the friends we promise to see a bit more of but corporally or temporally they've left this planet and we can't quite find our way back into their physicality so how do we glorify them, how do we celebrate them, how do we continue to talk to them in their absence and that's what this book was for me, it was a way of continuing to talk to someone that wasn't around but I wasn't ready to stop talking to. Um, as I wrote the book, and I guess did a scavenge into all the friendships that punctuated my lively wee life, I found that eating played a big part in those friendships. Mm -hmm. I sat down to meals with friends a lot of the time. The messier the meal, the better the friendship it seemed to be. <laughs> so I'm going to start off with a short piece about eating together with a friend. If this did contain a trigger warning, 
it, it, well, it would be that it contains a lot of very sloppy seafood. <laughs> um, it finds us on a road trip in the book, um, on a road trip with a dear friend called Scott, who I think, I think was in the bio, it was very robust, it covered a lot, it covered a lot, it was like a biography, a short statement, um, and with uh, Holly, and we're in a place in Scotland, and we're indulging in one of those seafood platters that gets your shirt messy. Dinner with you and Holly. These are palmary moments. No. No. I don't regret spending £75 on a seafood sharing platter. Aye. It's a crumb indulgent. And you call me a lush to Holly's hilarity. But we are twinned in this bonhomie. I do not regret us gorging ourselves on a platter boasting an estimated 40 mussels, 60 prawn tails, 10 gargantuan langoustines, 14 scallops, 18 oysters, and a heft of dipping bread. <laughs> a platter most definitely intended for filling more than two bellies. Of course there is wine. We would not do a meal such as this a disservice and be without it. The platter is its own constellation. It does not fit on the table for its circumference is akin to Jupiter, not decommissioned Pluto. You and Holly have to swap seats so as we can battle this formidable foe together in formation. We are leviathans, feasting with and on each other. The messy display attracts nods of reverence from onlookers populating the tables in orbit around us. These nods are a cloud of praise, comfortably taken. This comfort in taking praise is far too rare for brilliant you. Over yonder, the island of Skye sits down to tea with us. We address it in stories and long glances cast over. On Google Maps, this water is labelled inner seas off the west coast of Scotland, Atlantic Ocean, a very formal name for our salty guest the ghost at the table. Whilst eating the platter, there is a dearth of chatter. Let it be known, this is not portentous. It's the opposite, the gooey vim of not needing chit-chat. We are apples, here's our core, sprouting pips in every belly. Even vegetarian holly soups a muscle down. But shush, don't tell her family, or she'll never hear the end of it. <laughs> this supper, was garlic butter gorgeous. Love on its tiptoes, the last meal we had together and one of your last on this whizzing planet. It wasn't quite fit for purpose, but I surmise you chip in with Michael. It wasn't far off either. P.S. Yes, we ordered starters and all, but these were modest and too alluring to let pass by. The pudding you shared with Holly was one step beyond for me, but you looked your Rubik splitting it, and you were often one step ahead. PPS, by the time the £149.50 plus £20 cash tip cleared from my bank account two days later, you had left us, and something had left me. But right there, in that moment, we were brimful. It was love. So, although the book is, I guess, constantly searching for joy and celebration and, I guess, rites of passage and tributes we can do and road trips and pilgrimages and things we can eat to taste like these friendships and, you know, little rituals to bring our closer, closer back together to the people we miss at these points in time, there was no getting away from the fact that grief was... Um, spilling through the fissures of every book. There was this absence, there was this loss, there was this, you know, abundant crevice of, of, of emotion and pain that had to be overcome. So my editor at the time was saying, look, you've really joined us together, you've really cauterized the wound through writing this, but tell me just a little bit to contextualize this about how grief manifested in the body, its physicality, the teeth, the barbs, the gnarliness of it all. Um, so this is a chipper we 200 on grief, which I'm going to call one and two. It's not called that in the book. But I think it will keep on track for tonight. So that numerical fashion is, is, is just for you. It's a gift, <laughs> gift of numbers. So 
also a very inappropriate introduction to this next piece, but there we have it. The, check, the clipboard is back. Actually, substantially, um, when, I was touring, <laughs> when I was touring this book in the UK, uh, in Manchester and Liverpool, uh, we did these quite big theatres. There was a big 500 theatre person, person theatre. I did one that night with Holly. Someone waited like two hours in a queue at the end, and you can tell McNish fans in the audience, and I can tell Peterson fans that you know there's there's less of them. Um, <laughs> but this person had, had waited right till the end, and they sort of throw me eyes at one point. It's like, a Peterson fan right there. Mm -hmm. Right till the end, two and a half hours at the end of the book queue, happy to be there, wanting a sort of confessional tip to tip. I thought. <laughs> and she was actually just there to ask me where I got my clipboard. <laughs> <laughs> she hadn't even bought a fucking book, so I didn't tell her. That was good. My first question. <laughs> Look at my question. Where do you get the clipboard? Well, we can we can get into that, you know. If if, if there's books in hand, now you know the sorcery, the answer to the the clipboard magic. You can't be dead. I can see what's kind of an inappropriate introduction in that first sentence. You can't be dead, because we're still on holiday. Because my brain is still processing the images of the last few days from short-term to long-term memories. And I've not yet shown anyone the pictures from our trip. I've not yet shown anyone the pictures from our trip because I am not yet home from our trip. So you can't be dead. The ink still wet on the page so there's no way the book's gone up in flames. You can't be dead because we're still mid-conversation on a hundred relatively inconsequential things and we're about to pick those conversations back up and finish the suckers off like we said we would because your litter is still in the back of the car because the moon is still the same shape as the moon we feasted under and there's rainwater in my hair from that sudden downpour that caught us out and I've not yet emptied the sand down my shoes, and I'm still full of adrenaline from all the fun we had, nor having, and my face hasn't stopped throbbing from those laughter clouds we created, and there's that daft, daft stain on my jeans yet to be washed out. You can't be dead, because I just got an email about our arrival times from Ullapool Book Festival, and I know the answer to that question, and I don't want to let them down. <coughs> Two, defying all science, grief feels its hottest when newly lit, before it's even started smoking, before the birds know to stop singing and be forever silent, before the embargo on mooting a date for the funeral's been lifted, before one of my friends knows not to throw a strop because I haven't got back to his invite for a camping trip that apparently needs the numbers before any notion of talking in the past tense is fathomable, before Auden's poem, Stop All the Clocks, could possibly be about you. Feels like a drug that's newly entered the body and will deliberately dawdle in making the rounds. Inside, like a virus, the flesh bullying itself, my vital organs like two best friends who, for no real reason, fallen out. Yet on account of their hubris will never find a way back. Grief dissects us into our most helpless matter. My bones carry an unnatural weight in them, as if the marrow is turning to lead. My gait too is off like that bike with its bent wheel that required me to cycle like fuck just to make it to market less than two miles away. I'm on the cusp of crying, ordering a cappuccino, but as for chocolate sprinkles all the same because that's what I used to do, although I've no idea why, because I've never had a sweet tooth. I'm desperate for touch, and offended by the suggestion. I find myself looking into my own eyes, and every mirror I pass, eyes which have become bells that will not stop ringing until the jar cracks or the tongue falls out. Either way, it'll be over. It's been clumsy with meaning, after having prided myself on exactitude where 140 characters seems a stretch. It feels like I've had my last useful thought and now I'm salvaging ideas from the mulch. Time is standing still until it races by like a fox with a bird in its belly. Mostly, I feel exhausted, slow 
and eddying, heavier, whilst emptied of something I know will never be replenished, that I will always resent living without. I am heartbroken and coarse, whilst acutely thankful for all the wonderful, wonderful people around me. I feel important and guilty about that. Thank you very much. Hi, John. Oh, okay. That was my hi, John indication. Yes. Your birthday side in advance. I'm old chap. <coughs> we have special signals. And the hi, John is a signal that it's time for us to have a conversation. I think so. It seemed, right. uh, seemed polite. Yeah. <laughs> Attentive. Functional. Mm. To the point. Well, as you guys can probably tell, um, this book, to me, I mean, what the first surprise is about it uh, is that it is so extremely alive and extremely carnal and kind of voluptuous in this way. And you mentioned that eating plays a big role in it. And in general, it seems to me that sort of that all the mundane acts of living and sort of, sort of eating, drinking, partying, talking, it's very much about being alive. It's not really about being dead at all in a way, um, which I suppose makes sense because it's it's hard to write a book about being dead. <laughs> but, um, but it's just not the book that I expected it to be when, when, uh, because I knew in advance that it was about the death of a friend, um, which one of, the, one of the cool things about the book, from my point of view, is just that that clearly, on a, on a kind of writing level, acted as a catalyst for you to examine your life very closely and with a lot of relish, you know, there's a tremendous amount of relish in the, in the writing of this book and in the life that it describes, all the different lives that it describes, because another great thing is that it's not just about you, it's a, really a, a portrait of all these important people in your life. Um, we were joking earlier about how uh, when people raise their hands sometimes in readings and they say, you know, I, this isn't so much a question as it is just a statement. <laughs> and then they just say something, and I feel like that's exactly what I just did. Well, I've got, I'm going to use internet. I feel like that was oh, a, right. a, a generous um, op opening statement. Okay, so you're off and running now? Yeah, I think so. Um, so very much, uh, I was writing about a loss, but I was trying to figure out the version of myself that I was without this friend in my life. And that caused me to go into this real scavenge into all of the other friendships that were around me. And even the friendships that were no longer in my life. Um, and I found that a lot of seminal friendships that I had been edified most, that I felt um, emotionally I'd learned most from as a, a, as a human being that made me this sort of con cocktail of flesh and bone and vital organ that I was today were no longer with me in an active sense. Now they hadn't left the planet in the way that Scott had, they would maybe just geography had moved us apart, maybe fallouts had moved us apart, maybe we just weren't the hu same human beings that had that sort of vocabulary of friendships anymore, but I didn't want those friendships to be seen as failures because they were still beautiful, they were still ephemeral, I was still celebrating, I was still edified by them, I was still buoyed up by them, I still thought about some of these friends nearly every day, even though I hadn't seen them for 10 years, and I didn't necessarily even want them back in my life, because I wasn't the person I was in that friendship, and they most likely weren't the person they were in that friendship, and there'd be so much catching up to do, that would almost be an infringement on our life, but I still wanted to be able to laud those friendships, eh? friendships for the transient brilliance that they brought into our lives. They couldn't be labelled failures. I guess, dramatically in romantic situations, if you're no longer in that romantic relationship, it's a failure. But I don't think those rules have to apply as hard and fast to friendships or even romantic situations, but it wasn't my uh, fight to flag at that point in time. Also. The main friendship with Scott in the book, um, to do that any sort of genuine plaudit or to do that any sort of accomplishment in terms of representing the friendship I was missing, it had to be silly, it had to be smutty, it had to be full of love but also full of jokes. Him leaving the planet was just this one moment. But actually the years of friendship that came before that was so much to bask in. And if I was to do any tribute to this human being, it would have to be as humorous as it was, you know, sucking up his arse and quite beautiful and all of these different things, or else he wouldn't have enjoyed reading it. 
you would have got bored with my murky forlornness and moved on to the next thing. But the humour and the lightness of touch and the way that we sparked off it had to be represented in the grief to the same extent that it was represented in the love. Is that how you, was that one of the things you used to, to write the book, a sort of, a sort of guide rail for you to think about what he would think of if he were actually to read the book? Were you sort of thinking of him as, because every book has one or more sort of ideal readers in, in their author's mind, and I guess you probably must have been thinking of him, and, and I can't, well, maybe I shouldn't put it this way because he would think that was daft or something. So, yes and no. Um, I sort of, any time I found myself, I guess, sucked into the vacuum of the more murky, forlorn, ferocious elements of grief, I would choose a favourite moment or a favourite story of us, ours, that I know that we both relished because it was one of those ones that we would revisit every time we were having a drink back in Glasgow. We'd talk about this great time that we did an animal safari in South Africa, and I would almost distract myself in... I guess quite a safe way by focusing on the revisitation of favourite moments between us and I would write about those, I would explore those, I would bask in the memory of those to such a way that like all these new details were unfurling in them that I didn't know neurologically I had in the memory banks because I've never spent that time amount of time reinvested in those memories. So I guess I was distracted by my, myself by writing about verified favourite moments until I was ready to get into, I guess, the catastrophic nature of the grief. And I, I knew that he enjoyed talking about those moments with me, so there was already some sort of sanction that came with them. I wasn't writing um, to impress him, but I guess I was writing to, to, the, to him, and I wanted to pick back up a lot of these conversations we hadn't finished, and the only way to do that was in this sort of a pistol letter and diary type of style form. Mm -hmm. And of course your friendship with him is is the main sort of central friendship discussed in the book, but leading up to it there it's sort of it's almost sort of like a sentimental education in in, in kind of described in, in terms of male friendships that you've had. And that was really fun. I mean I enjoyed each of them uh, in their own way. Um, but I wonder, you know, I mean, you, a lot of these people you've lost touch with, and um, I'm wondering how much influence that had on your writing of the book. I mean, you must have thought potentially some of these people with whom you'd lo totally lost contact might come across this book in some way through mutual friends or just by chance, and then kind of encounter these descriptions of themselves. Descriptions that are always very loving and warm, but of course, there are warts in all descriptions. You know, you, you definitely talk about the good and the bad. Was that hard to do? Yeah, you know, it was it was a pleasure to do. I mean, I was very soppy about it. To be able to revisit these friendships that I'd probably... So I guess by losing contact with these friendships, I've lo I'd lost co contact with a lot of people I could talk to these friendships about. So like trying to talk about a stranger that was this really important seminal friend to you that's no longer in your life and no longer connected into the circuits of the, this sort of wider orbit of friendship around you can be quite difficult or quite obtuse or quite clumsy to find your way conversationally into it. So this gave me the excuse to revisit all of these friendships that I really sort of carry almost secretly or with a little bit of shame, but allowed me to take down the counter of shame to say, look, this person's no longer in my life. I've not seen them for 10 years. In fact, the main um, timeline of our friendship covers like my teenage period to my early 20s, but I still think that they play a more crucial part to the formation of who I am today or the more successful elements of who I am socially as an individual and the way I'm able to sort of sentiently relate to people than a lot of people I've met at my apogee, at the zenith of who I am as an emotional being. It's the people that you made mistakes with and fumbled with and a lot of that time it is in the teenage years or the early 20s where you either feel invincible or you're exploring alcohol or drugs or you're exploring like you've started reading Kafka for the first time and you're sort of embodied by that. There's the, the almost like the more pretentious elements of yourself that you that you bonded over at that time. There's these emotional extremes that you're not really allowed to revisit, especially if you're in the arts now. You know, it's a trepidation about that from that perspective. So, yeah. But with some of them, I guess it was maybe a calling card in the hope that they did get in contact and they did stumble upon the book. 
Um, other ones, I think, have went down a path that they're, you know, they're, if they're alive, they're definitely not picking up my book in bookshops. So there was a there was a safety net with some of them as well that I knew they moved so distantly from the conversations we used to have that there was no risk of it. And then with other ones, yeah, it was maybe sending out the friendship back signal. Right. And this book came out in the UK, you said, I think you said in July. July. So not that long ago. Not that long ago. Have, has anybody gotten back in touch with you? So, so yes. Oh, uh, really? I didn't just say that to lead into it, but we sort of got back in contact with each other when I was signing off the writing period, because a lot of the friends, um, so you get this sort of legal read with it as well, and a lot yeah. of these friendships were riddled with petty crime and drug use and different things in this sort of, I'm invincible, I can do anything, sort of tirade of uh, teenage emotionality. So the lawyers were not very happy at all by we calling them by their own names. Oh yeah. But the people I was allowed to call, call by their own names were because there was no legal risk, because it was celebratory, it was a PM to them, it was a love letter. So there was one particular friend in the book called Daniel that had sort of been a high school friend there and had lost touch with um, writing about him um, sort of synchronizing in terms of there was a sort of synchronization of him reaching out to me at that point in time and I thought well actually I can I can show you this bit about you in the book and I know we're pally again. Oh that's it great. Came to one of the book launches in Port Bell and I've got so it's a prose book, there's a lot of poems that got pushed out the side of it that were sort of too 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 poetry specific to be Trojan horse into it, but there's this one that I often read to contextualise it, maybe I'll do it afterwards, um, which is called The Cat Prince, it's about a particular period in my life where I was convinced I was more feline than a human child. <laughs> um, I'd go around to people's houses and completely derobe and pound around trying to be a cat, <laughs> and trying to recruit people's children into my naked cat cabal. Um, and Daniel was one of the he was like my co-prince. He was the, the first and the most fervent recruit to the gang. Um, um, he's, he's a lovely emotional individual, but he's a laconic man. He's a man of few words. You know, I'll send him these big sprawling texts these days. And he's like, sounds good, bro. See you later. That sort of thing. And I know there's more bundling underneath it, but I'm trying to extract it at that point in time. Uh, and I was doing this in conversation in the UK with a writer called Kay Tempest, who's on the same little publishing strand as, as me on Facebook, we've got the same editor and stuff like that. So we're chatting about books and I knew he was a big Kay Tempest fan and I read this Cat Prince and Kay was like, is your fellow Cat Prince in the audience some, somewhere in the, in the back there? And then Daniel sort of sheepishly put up his, <laughs> his hand in, one of his, in front of one of his favourite singers at that point in time. So not only have I brought him up back into my life, I've humiliated him in front of one of his favourite artists. Oh, yeah. that's perfect. Yeah. Um, do you think that, yeah, earlier I was going to ask you a question, which is, I wonder if, in terms of romantic relationships, and, the, and the, these friendships in this book, they do sometimes kind of, kind of dance along the edges of what almost seems like a romantic uh, um, relationship, you know, I mean, there's an intensity to it, it's also in the way that you talk about them, this sort of very open way that, at least in the United States, men certainly are not accustomed to talking about their male friendships, you know. Uh, which is certainly a very impressive aspect of the book. But um, do you think that in the same way that, that, that there's this kind of thinking about romantic relationships, that you know, these, these certain very, very passionate, very intense, sort of all-consuming uh, romantic entanglements are usually not destined to last. They usually do end abruptly and, and oftentimes dramatically. Do you view the friendships that you've had in the same way, like the ones that are really, really intense mm -hmm. and that were therefore very well suited to inclusion in this book, were also somehow not destined to last forever, because maybe because they, they just couldn't be sustained in that way? Yeah, I think so. I mean, are some of the more emotionally volatile relationships that I describe in there, I knew it was this sort of all or nothing approach, and I knew at certain times we were getting absorbed so much into each other's sort of emotional acumen that at one point we were going to have to extract ourselves from, a, from from each other because someone would fall in love with someone in a more physically romantic sense that would pose a risk to that friendship or we were changing so fast at that period of time that perhaps realistically there was only certain a certain period of time where we could follow that same trajectory. So it is the whole sort of fast burning candle shooting star cliche that falls into being but it did feel 
real and valued and authentic and verified at that point in time. So I was suspicious a lot of the time of the more beautiful friendships there, but was also comfortable about how fast they can come in and out of your life from that perspective. Um, and the little sort of romantic tragedy in me sort of prompted <coughs> the heartbreak of them from that perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, I grew up with one sister and a lot closer to my mum and I was very almost envious of the emotional, physical vocabulary they had to their friendships. You know, they would do the simple things like my sister linking arms with her friends or having sleepovers where they'd share a bed and hide under the sheets together and spill each other's secrets. like. I wanted that. I was, I was jealous of it. I was envious of it. I tried to disastrous effect to try and <laughs> in, 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 integrate that into a lot of my male friendships. And that wasn't the algebra of male friendship that we'd been taught by their siblings or their fathers. So often got recoiled from it. It was everything from like laughing it off to social exclusion to homophobic abuse to whatever. Just when you sort of gave too much fat too fast under these circumstances. Apart from Daniel, he was all in from the goal. <laughs> <laughs> all, all four paws ready to go. Um, another thing that you talk about in the book in an in a open way and in a slightly different way from what I was used to seeing um, is, uh, is the drug use. Because there are some friendships, there are certain moments in the, in the book where, I mean, there are friendships that you had that, um, in which drugs played a big part. You know, not necessarily the reason for hanging out, but it was definitely uh, a big part of what you guys did together. And um, I, I liked the, the matter of fact way that it was discussed, in the same way that you might discuss uh, what you had for, for dinner on a given evening, you know, which is very contrary to, I think, the way drug use is, is usually portrayed. And also, just in general, you kind of resist the the urge and maybe the, maybe the pressure, uh, the social pressure to treat drug use, even heroin use in your book, as something that is automatically sort of um, disastrous and, 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 and dooming. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, you do acknowledge that some people got into a lot of trouble with it, yeah. and some people disappeared because of it. But I think that there's a certain type of cliche of, of drug use um, that is condoned and even encouraged, at least in, in, in American literature, uh, probably for moralistic reasons, you know, and also because it's a very dangerous topic that, of course, you know, God forbid you'd influence some young kid to do something that, that could be risky. But it's a very tricky thing to write about drug use, I think, because the, the reality is that for many people, perhaps most people, flirtations even with heavy drug use and narcotic use do not destroy them. You know, we always tend to focus on the stories that are the most tragic. But I wonder if you had a hard time convincing your editor, your publisher, or, or, or readers later once the book was published that that's an okay way to talk about drug use. It's sort of a matter of fact thing that young people get into that can be very dangerous, but can also just be a kind of fun thing that eventually runs its course. Yeah, so I definitely, I guess the main struggle with it was with myself. Um, I have, so there's a period in the book where I have this friend called Jake in Manchester. I'm actually working as a trainee solicitor at the time. I needed a hobby job until the more lucrative career of poetry kicked off. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought I'll have a tumble with the corporate casino down in London. Um, and I get into sort of recreational heroin use smoking it, then injecting it, and it sort of seeps into my life through this friendship. And I couldn't talk about this really seminal friendship <coughs> without talking about the fact that that actually brought heroin into my life for a short period of time. But it was such a tightrope experience of not wanting to glamorise the degree and the sort of gargantuan nature it played in our friendship, because he went darker down that road. He had comas, he didn't come back from it to a certain extent. Uh, I don't know if he's alive or dead anymore, um, but certainly heroin swallowed him up in another way, and I managed to use it quite recreationally um, in a way that didn't really take over my life, and then when I found myself using heroin not in his presence, 
then I figured it was now having this new conversation with me, which our friendship wasn't fed by and wasn't part of, and I had to sort of cut it out. Um, I grew up in Leith, in Portobello in Edinburgh as well, which obviously Urban Welsh writes about the tree, the heroin epidemic coming through there at that point in time. Urban's a pal, we've done shows together, and uh, I wanted to make sure that people didn't, I actually do a disclaimer and say, look, this is not the train spotting story, that is not the type of drug use that I lived. It was a small epoch of time. It got um, more all consuming than I intended it to, and then I cut it out of my life, and that is a very sort of straightforward dialogue. So I needed that drug story to be part of it, but only so far as it related to the timeline of our friendship and where it took me at that point in time. I didn't want to go on any, any aberrational drug tales or anything that wasn't necessary to how we relate to each other through this drug. But it was a very particular balance that I had to play because this wasn't a drug memoir, it was a friendship memoir. Just one of these friendships brought a lot of drugs into my life. Um, and yeah, we go very different directions in terms of how um, catastrophic those drugs can have a, an influence on our life. And I didn't want to be too blithe about how it affected me and how easy it was either. So I actually got a few friends that were around that period at the time that maybe went a bit deeper into the drug use and have now came back with it to read that period and say, is this accurate? Am I not glamorizing it? And is it is, is it okay to talk about it in this fashion from your perspective? So I, I had my own personal copy editor so that the publisher seemed quite up for it, I guess it made the book a bit edgier. <laughs> <laughs> but it, and yet the way that you deal with it is is not in any way sensationalistic. I think that's really all I was trying to say. Even when your friendship ends, it's clear that his drug use is, is part of what sort of sped up the end of the friendship, but it's not the reason that your friendship ends with him. You know, there's a you make clear that there are all sorts of reasons that you guys went your, your separate way. Yeah, yeah. He was so much bigger and more beautiful and buoyant and such a sort of machine gun presence of a human being, but also so sort of tender. It was just all of the contradictions I love in a human being. Mm. Um, and the drug use was part of that. Um, but he perdured, he existed beyond it. So yeah, it was just one of the facets of him and it was very important to me not to sensationalize it. He's a sensational individual. All the risks and the jubilations that the drug offered were already present in him on a bigger and bolder scale. So it was just a sort of incarnation of that within him. Right. It occurs to me now that just as we're talking that, that this book is of course also uh, a portrait of, of, of youth. It's about being young. In a way, these certain types of intense friendships that we were just describing, they're not unique to, to young people, you know, between the ages, I don't know, 15 and, and 30, but they're definitely more common at that period in one's mm -hmm. life, you know. I mean, I've, I've had a sort of melancholy feeling in, at times when I was reading the book because I thought, God, you know, when's the last time that I felt like this in friendships that I had, even if those friendships of mine had once felt that way. But, um, it's kind of something that is really those sorts of super intense friendships that then suddenly end as well. Um, that does seem like, like really something that happens primarily in one's twenties. And if one has a real gift for friendship, maybe maybe they can happen later in life as well. Have you found that to be true in your life when you were writing this book or when you read from it now? Um, I don't even know how old you are. How old are you? I'm um, thirty-eight. Oh, good God! <laughs> I thought you were, I thought you were still young. Uh, no, no. But, um, <laughs> well, I'm still working on the facial hair. I yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> hard living has left its scars on you, obviously. But, but um, when you were writing a heroin diet, can <laughs> 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 so I always thought the heroin really pickled a person and preserved them in a wonderful way. Like uh, William S. Burroughs, you know, who looked old when he was 30 and then looked exactly the same when he was seven years old. <laughs> um, but no, what I wanted to ask was, do you feel like this type of friendship is something that is more something in your past? Did you feel kind of nostalgia for a, a younger version of yourself? Or is this is this something that's ongoing with you? Do you do you have new friendships now that have this same kind of heady, almost narcotic, headlong feeling that these friendships have? Um, narcotic in an emotional sense, definitely. I still feel like I am uh, very go into friendships very quick, uh, very unguarded, very candid, very excited, 
uh, with the jubilations. I feel like they're high octane. There's an effervescence and an energy to them. <coughs> so yeah, I still I still feel that's very much presence. And damn it, I guess that's the the big thing about a lot of the friendships is like. I want you to blur the boundaries, make it a bit more obfuscating and opaque between physically romantic love affairs and friendship love affairs. I think friendships collectively or singularly can be some of the greatest love affairs of our lives. Um, it definitely felt like the mantra for that book from this perspective. I grieve friends, I feel the heartbreak of friends. There was no distinction for me when friends sort of pushed you away to be my dumped by a romantic partner. It felt like the same um, the same heartbreak, the same gut-wrenching separation was a bit forced upon you from that way, vehemently, hostilely, dramatically. And the same powerlessness too, you can't do anything mm. about it. Yeah, and, 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 and it takes you straight back to like being a kid, to trying to impress these people, to bring them into your life, and thinking, what have I not got that they don't want, And mm -hmm. from that perspective. So you can feel so small, so lonely, so quickly. And then a new friend comes into your life and it, and it can change so dramatically as sure. well. Right, and you can, much as with romantic relationships, as you said earlier, you can kind of think back to this friendship that ended badly, that you feel sadness about, and then realize that the person you are now, you wouldn't, you wouldn't you couldn't even function in that friendship. You might not even care for that friendship. Yeah, yeah, I'm definitely still putting myself out there in the new friendship market. <laughs> <laughs> So what friendships apps are you on? <laughs> I, I don't know if there is one. There maybe that's be. maybe that's the sort of ten Someone here tonight. Are, are, are there actually? Well, it, you do. Is it Hint Bumble has a BFF uh, option? Yeah. But it's not a specific app dedicated only to friendships. No, but so like they have business, that and French uh, oh, dating really? and friendship. So it's like just like that oh, area oh. of it is like friendship. The business of friendship. <laughs> no, 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 I was, was going to say, someone needs to monetize this yeah. tonight <laughs> and, um, and start an app. But I guess, you know, as with all good ideas, someone, someone's done it already. But I'm interested with so many, like, friendship. Friendship literature is a big thing. Like, I've always been, I've always found it quite icky, or I've always been quite trepidatious to say that this is a memoir, because memoirs always make me recoil, because it's like they cut, cut the... Um, for all the grandioseness of it, this is the life best lived, you should sort of take from this, you should, you know, there's just something in my life that you should be learning from, the memoirs always said to me, and of course it's not that, it's a much wider genre than that, it's just somebody showing the workings of their life, the mistakes, the foibles, the successes of them, and the hope that you can project your own life into them and think, yes, me too, or feel some compassion in that. Um, but I have been really fine to call this a... Uh, so what type of book of boyfriends? I was like, oh, it's friendship literature. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, we, were, we were talking earlier about other examples, what you consider to be other examples of this very small and specific genre of yeah. friendship literature. I think you mentioned The Fellowship of the Ring. Lord of the Rings, right? <laughs> One of the, the entire cycle. The, yeah, all obviously. of them. The whole, all, all, the, all the token books, right? The, particularly The Fellowship of the Rings, I guess, because it's got the yeah. titular Maybe banner. not The Silmarillion so much. No, but that has been, you know, made into a good series. But we'll yeah. get to that. We'll get oh, to okay. that. Um, we don't have to get to that. Oh, I'm in now. I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> I was in now. I was in the breaks the, now. The Tolkien fan club when I was young, back when it was a mailing letter in the UK. <laughs> but actually, that's, that's, that's a bit of a lie. My friend was a member of it. He paid the membership and then he would, <laughs> and then he would send it on to me afterwards. So I was sort of tangentially a member of it. But I think that, like, Tolkien especially is one of the greatest. Um, writers of a particularly male friendship uh, literature. I mean, you look at Lord of the Rings, you've got Frodo and Sam. You've got these two best friends. Sam, I guess the more lovable, affable character of them all, keeps his faith in Fro Frodo, sort of endures him, despite the fact that he becomes this sort of unpredictable, quite irascible version of themselves, but he understands that he's been affected by this nefarious power of Sauron, uh, Sauron, and he is the crutch, he is the long-lasting friend that everybody hopes for when they're at their weakest. He, rec he recognises that this is not the friend that he fell in love with, the friend he loved with is somewhere in there, and he'll carry them to the end if he needs to. And then you've got Gimli, 
and Legolas, the dwarf and the elf, the Montagues and the Capulets, we'll say, of the book. They're, they're bred not to like each other. They're opposite of kin. Um, you know, through camaraderie, through bravado, through jokes and jostling and competition, they pull themselves together and then it becomes acceptable. They've got the emotional permission to then unravel the more compassionate selves to them and they're all of a sudden breeding kin and characterization doesn't matter and they're just a pair of friends. Could go on, but we'll leave it there. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't want to leave it there quite yet because when I think about Frodo and Sam, though, what's interesting in, in relation to your book, if we can bring it back to your book, is um, that the intensity of the friendship between Frodo and Sam has often been remarked on by fans, that it's almost a love affair. You know, there's this kind of bubbling sort of homoerotic kind of kind of charge running just under the surface, especially in the in the later, maybe the last book of, of, of the series, you know. Yeah. And even the movies, you know, I mean if you look at like commentary on, on the movies, all sorts of jokes are made about about Frodo and Sam. And um, you know, that puts me in mind of certain friendships in your book that do come very, very close. <coughs> and they even like they briefly, some of them briefly kind of skip over and do become physical. Like there's a little bit of making out and kind of stuff like that that happens, you know. Um, but but in general, the friendships are just they, they really do walk that that line, and there's a, there's a, there's kind of a suspense there and a, and a charge to that, of course, as well. Yeah. Which um, also I think happens a lot uh, with young men, like in their teens or early twenties, that they're you know, in my experience among friends of mine, that's sort of the time <coughs> when quote unquote straight men are are somehow drawn to this this idea of seeing how far can I go up to that line before things become physical. Or if they do become physical, what happens then? Does that destroy our friendship? Is it something that we can kind of chuckle about later or do we have to pretend that it never happened or even that we never met? And that's a that's a fascinating thing that I haven't seen written about very much. Yeah, and I want you to I want you to exhibit that and also to provoke it without giving any sort of settled answers because I wanted people to pull anything of their own life into it, their own experience they've had, whether it was ecstasy experience, whether it was like early uh, incarnations of queerness, any of these different things. I want you to explore that within the friendships. To go back to Frodo and Sam, at the end <laughs> of Lord of the Rings, Frodo kisses Sam. And it just says he kisses him, it doesn't specify it's on the cheek, on the lips, anything like that. Frozo kisses Sam and he gives the book to Sam to finish his story. It's Sam that will be, I guess, his representative within the Shire now. It's for Sam that will finish his book. And there's this sort of hovering invitation for Sam to come out and join them at a later date in the Undying Lands and people speculate and postulate about that from all those perspectives and there is a physicality to the friendship. And it's a romantic physicality to the friendship and at death it doesn't really need categorization about where it goes next and I want you to try and fly the flag for that through all of the friendships that I've had from that perspective as well. Yeah, because in literature in general um, there seems to be this kind of reductive approach where when you have a situation like that, either in, in, in novels, let's say, particularly, it either leads to someone coming out as gay or, or maybe the relationship itself becomes a real sexual relationship or there's a falling out as a result of one person kind of making it physical and then things kind of, the two men never see one another again. Mm -hmm. You know, those seem to be the two modes. Yeah. Whereas in reality, things are actually far more nuanced than that. And you can have these various uh, experimentations or, or, you know, stumblings or fumblings or, you know, oh, maybe that wasn't the right thing to do or maybe it was fun but not right for us. And, but very often friendships endure and it's not necessarily, you know, real life is just not like a, like a novel that has to build to some crisis which then shatters like, the, you know, the existing order. And that was another fun thing about the friendships in this book, you know. In a, in a similar way, at least from my point of view, to the way you, you dealt with drug use, the way you deal with, with these sort of moments of physicality mm -hmm. between the male friends, it's kind of in a matter-of-fact way, yeah, so this happened and it was sort of interesting or it was maybe slightly regrettable. And, uh, and anyway, so the next day we went to the beach or we went on this road trip, you know, and it isn't like this be-all, end-all thing. It's not treated, it's not... It doesn't have that soap opera feeling, you know. It has it has a, a, a genuine reality to it, which is which is refreshing. Yeah. No, I wasn't trying to dwell on any of these moments. If they didn't fracture the friendship, then there was no need for me to sort of forensically put the microscope to them. If the friendship then moved on to the next big exciting friend, and 
uh, next big exciting adventure, a voyage, a quest, and that just became a part of the lore of this friendship. Then I just dealt with it. Matter of fact, as you say, lay the workings bare as honestly as you can, and then move forward with it. Yeah, yeah, I thought that was quite remarkable. There's the I'm quite obsessed with a UK cult movie called With Nail and I. Has anyone seen it? A few nods. Great. <laughs> and it's about it's about these sort of two out of work actors that get embroiled in this alcohol crazed trip, uh, sojourn into the countryside to try and straighten themselves out, to try and lay the world to right, set the world to right, and sort of decide the star cloud trajectories they're going to go off to into the Thespianic uh, world at that point in time. But in the truth of the matter, it's a story about <coughs> two best friends who know they've went too deep into their friendship. They've almost fused together as human beings. Mm -hmm. And it's friendship at, it's not just friendship at what cost, it's friendship at all cost. And it occurs to one of them that he is going to have to pull himself out of this situation, extract himself from it, or he's going to go down with that ship. Um, and that was really fascinating to me because it was also full of love and closeness and hilarity and hostility and all of these different things. But at the core of it, there was these two best friends that were ultimately going to destroy each other if they stayed together. And it just took one of them to recognise that. And I've got a copy of that script of With Neil and I that I've read quite a few times. I've got signed off Richard E. Grant, who plays the premier rogue With Neil in it. Um, and I did want to put a microscope on different friendship movies and literature from that from the perspective. It was very interesting to hear that you went to a, a party at the director's house. <laughs> By accident, I wasn't invited. I was <laughs> uh, but that's for another time. I think maybe we should, uh, maybe, I don't know, were you going to read again or should we take some take questions? Take a couple of questions, then I'll read again to close it yeah. off. It means if I give a bummer of a last answer, I can still maybe rescue it with the captain. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> rescue me right now from having to tell this anecdote by taking questions. Yeah. Uh, Hi, I'm Jessica. Does anybody have any questions? None. Thank you. I have a question. Great. Um, in the book, you talk a lot about like our lack of language around friendships. And I like when you talk about the idea of like a friendship contract. In like practical terms, do you see any steps towards that? Like how, how do we improve that and actually get where you're kind of imagining in the book? Do you think that it's through literature or do you think like what are the other steps to get there that you would imagine? Yeah, I mean I think really doing what I, for me, what worked best it was doing an emotional friendship audit of all of the friendships I've had in my life and to try and recognise what I brought into them, what they gave me from them and why they ended. And then having this sort of overview, this sort of overarching view of the timeline of the friendship. And that's why it's easier to do it with friendships that are no longer in your life because they do have a start, middle and end. They do have a finished timeline. So they, in a sense, even though emotionally you're carrying them with you, from a timeless perspective, they are stagnant. So I think through an evaluation of all of these different friendships and understanding the cocktail of experience, that um, we drew from each other them and how, what, what powers we take from them, and they are powers from that perspective. We can understand what we are offering as a friend over the years, how that's changed, how that's evolved. Um, I guess I was trying to put some of my legal training to use in, in, in inventing a friendship for contract, but really a contract from friendship for the perspective of what can I offer you, what can you offer me, and what would be the terms of breach, what would be pushing this friendship too far, and of course it can't really be categorised that far in advance, it would have to be ever moving, it would have to be super fluid, um, but I think just having a conscientious evaluation, compendium, audit of all of the friendships that have punctuated our lives and just to think how they differed from each other, what vagaries existed within them and really I guess looking at how they began and how they ended is some of the most seminal friendship literature that we've already got invested in ourselves. I hope that mildly answers the question. I'll come up with a better answer tomorrow. <laughs> Did you always think of your friendships like this, or did, did the idea of the book kind of uh, move you to, to sort of take another uh, framework to the friendships? 
So it caused me to take it back on my terms. I guess I have a lot of failed friendships because I was very emotionally demanding in a sense. Um, but I was very emotionally giving as, as well. Like I wanted to be fully absorbed in this friendship really quickly, like a lit match. I was very impatient about finding the type of friendships that I'd read about in book books which were just so all-encompassing they can change, change the trajectory of your life and mostly that scared other people off from a, from a young age and I would find myself sort of trying to mollify myself to the extent that I just couldn't anymore and then I would burst from that perspective. So, um, but then I guess all of those failures had the the boon, the benefit of every now and again you would meet someone full of, full of the same chemical compositions that you were, that were sort of spilling out the edges, uh, as it were, from that perspective, and you would find yourself on these real like cavalcades of, of, of fast-flowing, new, important, all-encompassing friendships. So I guess it was about taking these failed friendships back on my terms and celebrating them when they were succeeding without worrying too much about why they dissipated. Cool. Okay. Hi. Um, <coughs> the, uh, these friendships, would you say that they had a definitive end, all of them, or when I think of my friendships I, that have ended, I am like, oh, it just kind of fizzled out. And like when you talk about a romantic relationship, usually it has a definitive end. So I guess I'm just curious as to those endings, were they definitive or not? Um, yes and no. I mean, yes, some of them are definitive enough that I don't what I could I could easily reach out to these people. I could easily try and regalvanize these friendships, to light the fuse on them again. But no, from the perspective of I'm still talking about um, the, I guess, more auspicious, more powerful benefits that those friendships brought into my life. But I think you don't ever certainly talk, do that with romantic situations as well. I mean, you constantly revisit whether what would happen if that person came back into your life. Sometimes you do it in a lamentable sense of saying, wouldn't it be unfortunate if I was in that relationship again? You, you probably do that with friendships to a certain extent. but. Um, definitive is, 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 is such a big word for some people, for something that you still carry with you, so it almost feels disingenuous to say it has a definitive end when I'm still writing about it and talking about it, I guess it still has currency, it still has an agency to it, despite the fact that physically I don't want it back in my life, but emotionally I'm still very aware of it, so there is, there is no definitive end from that perspective. Some of these, the, when some of these friendships ended, did it change how deeply you wanted to build new friendships? Because, you know, I had a, I, a lot of stuff you were saying happened to me where I had, a, we became one person. Yeah. Like, you know, our, I'm grateful for that. You know, um, you know, and we tried to get back together as friends. We drifted apart, but and it never happened because we had. Directions, but that breakup, like psychologically, affected my ability to connect with people. Did that change your? Did, were you just like that hurt too much? Mm, I don't want to do that again. So I think I was more of a friend <laughs> rebounder. <laughs> I think I was definitely like back out there trying to prove my worth, trying to be giddy with new friends, be like, I'll fucking show that bastard. Uh, so I was definitely then, I guess, offering parts of myself to new into new friendships that we should have and for everyone's canny insight, um, would have taken longer if I hadn't been stomaching some of the hurt of the loss. So uh, it affected the value that I felt I offered <coughs> as a friend and I guess the reciprocal action to that was me sort of giving them too much of my own value and own agency and own secrets too quickly as a method of, 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 of I guess, alluring them in quickly. So yeah, I was, I was more of a rebounder 
than a hermetical drawer. <laughs> <laughs> it occurs to me, though, that, as we're talking about this right now, that, that there is one very major difference between the way we kind of, the sort of social contract that we have with uh, romantic or sexual relationships and friendships. And uh, the one very glaring difference is that it's pretty, it's pretty ex much expected if you're having a romantic sexual relationship with someone that lasts for longer than you know, you know, a few weeks that there's going to be a real conversation at the end. It may not be a successful conversation, it may be two people talking across purposes, but there will be, usually, with most romantic relationships, you can say, you know, this day we were done, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, because we weren't sleeping together anymore, because, because I moved out, because they started sleeping with someone else, whatever it is, right? Whereas with friendships, sometimes you do have that definitive conversation, but it's usually very uncommon. I mean, very rare that you have that kind of, I'm not going to be friends with you anymore <laughs> because of this, 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 and this. Yeah. It's very rare, actually. I mean, we kind of always ghost our friends, almost, right? <laughs> it's, it's completely acceptable to do yeah. so. Well, I don't hang out with that dude. <clears throat> yeah. yeah. Yeah, you sort of, it's like a small glacier. You just sort of effervesce out of each other's lives <laughs> yeah. Yeah. from that perspective. And then comes the awkward moment when you bump into each other again and you have to acknowledge that you've not got in contact and you've not seen each other for a while. And here you are in the same social situation away. And there's those sort of platitudes that you exchange under those circumstances. But I've had quite a few, you know, solid sit down. This is the end of our friendship mm. conversation. So I'm, I'm That's a, very unusual, I think. Very unusual boy. I suspected that. Like. <laughs> uh, speaking of, I'm going to read a, a last poem to finish up the night. But before I do that, I want to say a massive thanks uh, to John for reading the book. I'm currently reading his book. He's an extraordinary writer, a great human being, and I was very chuffed when he agreed to do this. And I want to say a big thank you to Greenlight Bookstore as well for having us. One of the hippest bookstores in America, so one of the hippest bookstores in the world. <laughs> uh, so I'll do one last poem. It's called The Cat Prince. <laughs> I sort of fizzled with it a little bit earlier on. <coughs> so take, I'll take you back to that period where I'm convinced I'm more human, I'm more cat, more feline than human child. <laughs> Having these play dates, there's a few unsuccessful play dates prior to Daniel's recruitment. At that point in time, uh, my mum gets a few worrying phone calls over this period, inquiring as to why I was taking off all my clothes and declaring myself to be feline royalty and recruiting their children into the gang. Made for very few sequel play dates. And those that did occur often came with the caveat, the qualification that I did not become the cat prince. And more often than not, these play dates would be hosted in a public environment. <laughs> Many other sets of eyes on them. To a lot of people's dismay, that did not often discourage me. Uh, we've already got the spoiler, there is a cat prince and it is I. Then and now. I, from the cat prince, I declare, already on all fours, already balls naked in the house of Hasty, where there's Adam Hasty, Daniel, and me, the cat prince, where boyhood bud bursts, 12 years of silliness. That's the point where I should say I was actually 12. Really Daniel, I'm not slightly older. People think that's a cumulative age of a few of the three boys together, but no, 12 years old. 12 years old. 12 years of silliness. Adam laughs, frantic gas, guffaws, then pegs it to the bedroom, anticipating the chase. Daniel, wavering between cat and laddie, compañero and fugitive, succumbs to the Gnostic glamour, strips naked for the full feline transformation. Down to our little bloods, little furs, ready to bringe past the chide of absent classmates who might well hear of this and smite us with shame. For we are cuddle kings, hankering for Adam's adulation. Oh, Moggy, Moxie, we embrace the cat life, vow inurement to the side effects. Carpet burns. <laughs> Very bad carpet burns. Windlash pimpling. The sacrifice of language in each falsetto yell, as hunters were tasked.
by the Creator, our gaze a crosshair, our pounce a ripple of bravura. Who else so guilefully stalks some beams? We do well here. It's those damn cats again the neighbours would learn to yawp as I race by with a robin red breast between my jaws. Daniel finished shitting in their rhubarb patch. To be honest, that bit normally gets a bigger laugh. <laughs> you can only do that once. It's convenient not to think of the killer in us, assassin still, holding back our purr. As we coil our new cat bodies to a spring, Adam clambers feared atop the bed. And what happens next is louder than we'd hoped for. Adam's mum, startled by the cacophony, arrives, then screams, curtailing the play date. Later that night, she calls my ma concerned, though my mum never mentions this. I can only assume she was wise to her. The mythos, the hieroglyphs, fathomed we'd soon meet the type of trouble that can really shake boys down. Long days where the teeth tear it out of us and the claws don't stop coming, but not yet. I hear her whisper, not without this moment's orchestra of feeling. As a boy, I was whiskerless, weighed down by the nest of not squat in my belly. As a cat, so much more. Of course, as mother to the cat prince, she knew all this. Thank you very much. <laughs> Tonight. Let's have one more round of applause for my son, John. We've got signed books for sale at the register. We sure hope that you will get one. Um, we're going to try to get everyone out as close to nine as possible, but feel free to make your way up a couple books. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you guys. Yeah.